Ronaldo was sitting. As you just heard, this is Survival in a Capitalist City, and I'm your host, Mike McCabe. I'd like to welcome Sam Richards, a journalist, and a friend of mine, Robert Dannon, professor of anthropology. And what we're going to talk about is an article that Sam Richards wrote this past month. And the title of the piece is called Powerful Mobile Phone Surveillance Tools Operates in Obscurity Across the Country. That's, uh, that appeared in The Intercept. And I find it to be a very interesting title. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Same uh, Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, well, we were, uh, as, a, as a group of people here, we were kind of struck with uh, the fact that the NSA was recording our phone calls and there was a little stir for a while. I think people just don't really care any longer. But um, Sam, you came up with a story that talks about that uh, process going beyond our government to private companies. Can you give us a little briefing of, of the story that you wrote in uh, yeah. The Intercept? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I appreciate being here to talk about it. Um, it's... It, it, there's a lot of nuance to it, but in the nuance um, are the, the kind of the details that I find shocking. Um, so yeah, this private company is called Hawk Analytics, uh, based in Texas. It's a pretty small company, to be honest. They don't have a ton of employees or very much of a footprint whatsoever. But um, what they do have is a subscription product that they sell to uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, intelligence like the FBI. Um, and also, I hear references to private investigators, so non, you know, government entities using this product. And basically, what it does is it it's kind of like the NSA's, um, you know, wet dream sort of. So they're able to take any kind of spreadsheet that would come from a cell carrier, um, or even from third-party apps like Uber and Lyft, um, and put it in the system, and it supercharges the data processing. So back in the day. If there was a murder or a bank robbery, the police would order the cell phone companies without a warrant because that's legal. So it's just a demand to hand over large data sets. And from that, they would use pen and paper to sort of plot out. Here's the suspect. This is the evidence we're going to bring in court to show they were here at this time. And now with CellHawk, instead of having to plot all that on paper, the computer just spits it out incredibly quick. Um, so hypercharged kind of surveillance is what we're talking here. So they can, the only thing, isn't it? They they can do it uh, continuously as opposed to the NSA that just took blocks and went back to it later on. Right, right. It's it's actually got a lot of different uses. Um, it can target a single phone and process data, like in a historical sense. Uh, they can use it for live location tracking. Um, and even sending, you know, email and text message alerts to surveillance teams if a phone has done a certain behavior, like move out of a um, GPS kind of designated area. But more, I think, important is the ability for it to do a thing called link analysis, where, you know, this is what people initially were saying is the concern with NSA surveillance, not necessarily the content of any kind of communication but putting together a map of a whole social network of people. And CellHawk in particular is incredibly efficient at this. I mean, the, the company was founded by a guy who's a former AT&T systems engineer. So he knows exactly how all this works. And he took that and teamed up with former DEA investigators and these types to make this product. And I, I wasn't able to survey every single law enforcement agency that I thought used it across the country. But just from a small number of FOIAs that I sent in, it looks like it's a pretty widespread product. Um, and so I, I brought up the link analysis thing because after the capital attack, that's been right at the top of my mind. You know, 
this network of people, they weren't wearing masks, they weren't hiding themselves. So it should be easy for them with all these resources to figure out who was an instigator, where these people went and all that kind of thing. And that's, it's been a capability they've had for some time now, so. And you tie this up with uh, the facial recognition software that, that Bezo has and uh, a lot of other uh, companies. For, for a short time, I uh, worked f- with a company, a publishing company that dealt with security issues. And as I was, before I retired from the company, I, there were quite a number of stories talking about this facial recognition. So you tie that up with this and you can pretty much, uh, you know, lock the doors as far as people ending up in jail. Yep. Uh, so how did you get on this story to begin with? Oh, it was, it's kind of interesting. It was actually um, about four and a half or five years ago now. Um, I, I literally was just researching the, one of the fusion centers in Minnesota where all these analysts sit together and share criminal intelligence data, um, and spy on civil liberties groups and they have an about page. So I was reading it and it just had a reference to like, I think it might've at that time said ping listener, like P I N G. Um, but it also referenced Hawk analytics. And so I asked the sheriff in the sheriff's office at that time for, emails regarding cell hawk or hawk analytics and it took them a few months but they actually produced quite a bit of information and so like i said that was about four years ago and so i was just looking at this email thread where the vendor was talking with uh the procurement people at the fusion center who have to buy and sign these contracts and it showed clearly that they were eager to use a product that was enhanced and better than the one that they had currently uh, and they sent me an invoice showing that it was signed. Uh, so that was the previous sheriff. And I don't, at that time, I don't realize, or I don't think they realized that the information they handed was really valuable because they, they clearly didn't look through it all that well because they included usernames and passwords, <laughs> which yeah. I had to redact. Um, but then immediately after that, the sheriff started deleting their emails after 30 days. And so long story short that sheriff eventually loses and a new sheriff is elected kind of by surprise but he he was more of a transparency minded guy and i i followed up on a request for you know further information like statistical reports um training documents memos and other kind of things like that and three years later under this new sheriff they hand off this policy document to me and it, excuse me, it outlines kind of the, um, the procedures that they have to follow. And it says things like you're not supposed to target First Amendment groups or people based on religion and this and that. But it also lays out that they can use this product under the legal standard of reasonable suspicion, which is like the lowest level. That's like a cop pulling a car over. He has reasonable suspicion. Um, and later in the document, at the very end, it says any of the information submitted into this database can be stored for five years. And it, regardless of if it's used for an investigation, if they look at the data, that resets the clock. And so <laughs> putting all this together, it really lays out a program with it, no transparency. Uh, it took four years for this to come out. And they're collecting information and sensitive call detail record information on the lowest legal standard possible. And under Minnesota state law, just to close out this kind of <laughs> tirade, since 2015, we, we have a tracking warrant law that says any electronic data collected has to be collected under the probable cause standard, which is higher than reasonable suspicion. And I, I think in more in line with the Fourth Amendment. And so there's Hennepin County here. I, I had to squeeze the documents out of them. And finally, thankfully, The Intercept was interested in the story. And so I'm sure in other counties with le- even less oversight than here, cell hawks being used or abused probably in numerous ways. Um, and it's just, it's just kind of shocking because now we see the Capitol was just breached by these people. And if, if the local police of, around the country have such powerful tools, what happened? And I, I know that's kind of not why I was brought on to talk about it, but it's just hard to kind of miss that point, I guess. 
No, no, I, I want you to voice any, any opinion that you have. My, my astoundment is that these laws go on. You know, it's bad enough when our own government uh, tracks us down. Mm-hmm. But to allow companies, well, then again, in a capitalist society, anything that any, anybody can do to produce something for money, it'll be done. Right. <laughs> um, uh, I, I just can't understand how uh, these companies are allowed to exist. Bob, do you, you have any input in, in this as far as this, the, the social ramifications? Well, um, I have a couple of questions, I think, that are, that are fundamental before we get into the implications that I'd like to ask Sam. Um, what, um, were you able to ascertain what their, what their business model is? How do they operate business-wise, Sam? Oh, that's that's great. That's a huge thing. I'm glad you brought that up because it's it's really key to Hawk Analytics. Um, so, like I said, the, the CEO guy is a former AT and T uh, systems engineer, uh, and that's his background. So he makes a really really great witness in court. And one of the services that Hawk Analytics, from what I can tell from a lot of emails, uh, how enticed clients is they they're like, do you have any emergency or uh, cold cases that we might be able to help you on? And then one of the main things they offer, which I think is probably still on the website, um, it's literally just expert witness services. Uh, And so I can see that they're selling subscriptions uh, at a five user limit is the basic uh, level for like almost $5,000 a year. But then at the same time, he'll go into court and usually the circuit court or some other entity will also reimburse him for his services, closing these cases out. And it never it, or hardly ever is mentioned by local news reporters or court reporters that the guy doing the expert testimony has a vested interest in these cases. And I think that's a huge, you know, it's probably or it might not be a legal or a judicial kind of standard that he's violating, but it just it doesn't pass a smell test. And it at least is something that the people in these cases and defense attorneys should be aware of if you're going to be fair. Um and especially because if you really think about it, they are just tracking cell phones. You know, you, you could make arguments that this data technically isn't always 100% viable. It's just very convincing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be said there. And I kind of I wish more people with a scholarly approach to the legal system would tackle that angle because I think it's huge. Um, and yeah, it's a, another thing about the business angle that needs to be explored is the fact that this is a subscription service. So Hennepin County or, you know, Joe Schmo at the FBI, they're logging in through a portal to the servers that Hawk Analytics owns. So this company has the sensitive call records of millions of people across the US. It's not Hennepin County protecting the data. And when I asked them about data security measures, that was one of the questions that they just disregarded. And, you know, we already had the, um, what was it earlier in the year, the blue leaks, I think. That was a third party data broker that leaked a ton of super sensitive law enforcement uh, intelligence related information because it was, you know, stored improperly or someone clever had access to it. But Hawk Analytics, uh, just, just because, you know, it's a small team of people, that could be considered a soft target. And then anybody who was ran through that system's data is potentially up for grabs. Um, And I I think it's kind of crazy. Yeah, the expert witness angle is um, to to found the the economics of the company on that is 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 actually very smart. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't surprise me that someone who was uh, an 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 analyst for AT and T would would understand that marketing angle. I mean, I've worked as an expert witness um, actually in, in in photography years ago when, when it was wet photography before the age of uh, digital photography. And it, it paid, not only does it pay really well, but uh, whether it's a civil case or whether it's, um, whether it's a government prosecution, uh, what happens generally is, is that these are not trial, the, the, these are n- usually not uh, cases that are tried before a jury, so they're not very public. 
uh, very often they're run by administrative judges. And as you said, they're, they're trying to clear old back, you know, old caseloads mm-hmm. and to the, the state or the, or the, the municipality uh, will often, you know, pay a premium price to bring people in who can clean this stuff up for them so that they can file it away in the archives. And, you know, they, they, they use that, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's what administrators do. That's what bureaucrats do. And in this case, the bureaucrats happen to be part of the justice system. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end of the year, these are their metrics. These are, these are how they keep their jobs. They say, okay, you know, we, we, we figured out all of these cases and they're filed away. And we only paid this much to get it done. Now we're moving on. I did my job. So there's a there's a bureaucratic aspect to this that um, can't be ignored. Um, and again, the the angle in which you're looking at it is is that it's a it, it's bureaucracy by another means because they are intruding on people's privacy. Um, I, I think that the most interesting angle that I got from the article is, is that, yeah, this is, this is private business. And uh, a lot of the Fourth Amendment guarantees are, you know, they're questionable as to whether they, they apply to somebody who's just basically more marketing a service. Um, the, this, the oversight and supervision certainly isn't there that you would get if it were a, the FBI or the NSA or even a local police department intelligence unit. Yes, a hundred percent. And that was an angle that uh, it wasn't edited out, but I didn't really explore it in the article. I'd like to in a follow up, but just how this all factors in with uh, third party doctrine, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, which I find just to be complete (laughs) pile of doo doo, because it basically says that by nature of me or you having a contract with AT&T or our cell phone provider, we don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy for a lot of the data. And I think that's crazy because what, what is that that effectively means we're supposed to build our own cell phone networks if we want to have an expectation of privacy. So, yeah, the, the kind of mundane banality in, like you said, the bureaucracy of all this, it is interesting. And it's it's I think all of that sort of helps it fly under the radar, because like you said, a lot of this is administrative stuff, just closing, you know, checking off boxes and closing cases. So. Yeah, it's it's a good business model for him, and that I always with these kind of expose endeavors, it feels a little weird at times because you're like, well, I wonder how many more clients this publicity is giving them to further expand their business. But I think in the end, it's kind of worth it. And yeah, people people need to know that it is it is merging into more of a private thing, um, and and just the the market share of you know police intelligence uh and you know intelligence gathering tools like this it's only going to continue to continue to expand and we need to update our laws so that they're actually current yeah it, it also it, it it recalls the the very recent case um that they're still sorting out of solar winds so you know here we have another uh a private company that's providing um, national security with their software, mm-hmm. all kinds of national security agencies, including including the 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 parts of major corporations such as Microsoft, uh, the parts of those corporations which which are an issue of national security, although it's under the private it's under the private uh, supervision of Microsoft or Google, whoever's using it. But I mean the the, the very idea that a, a country would entrust um, its, uh, its national security apparatus to a software provider <laughs> who, uh, if, if you read the Times article about them last week, who for, for, for profitability measures first went around uh, cutting uh, all kinds of uh, internal security oversight. Wow. And, and then they exported their servers to uh, Bulgaria <laughs> And, and, and Romania because it was cheaper. So, you know, they're, they're, they're claiming that the systems were hacked uh, by um, either government or government front operators in, in Russia, but they only had to go next door to Bulgaria to do this <laughs> hacking because the uh, government had outsourced all of the security jobs to this private company. 
Right. So Call up your cousin. <laughs> when you're when when you get into this sort of the neoliberal the contradictions of of, of neoliberalism where you have uh, this this conservative reactionary surveillance apparatus on the one hand on the other hand you have this neoliberal model of profitability um, it, it does become really chaotic and anything can happen I mean you one would assume that if uh, if the software is available to police departments uh, drug cartels or, or gangs could use that uh, in order to track uh, in order to track a deal that they're going down I mean they, they may and, and I have no reason to doubt that many of these criminal enterprises are as sophisticated technologically um, as any police department anywhere in the world. Yep, a hundred percent. And I, I've come across anecdotal reports of them actually using CellHawk, which, you know, I mean, with how, how much money is flowing through organizations like the cartel or even ISIS, they had a they had a billion dollars uh, because of oil money flowing around at one point. So. Yeah, any any kind of technology company is going to just go to the highest bidder, um, and yeah, the cartels, uh, you know, uh, private investigators or insurance adjusters, um, all all kinds of that kind of stuff goes on. Um, and yeah, I, I think adding to your argument too, especially about the solar winds, I believe Bezos and Amazon are the sole, um, you know, server or cloud uh, providers for the Pentagon. So they've, they've really gone down that rabbit hole. I mean, it might be better for operations or whatever, but that's, uh, how could that not be a huge security vulnerability? Like you were pointing out, like outsourcing that kind of sensitive stuff to servers in Bulgaria, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the height of irresponsibility from a political point of view, uh, but that's what they do in order to trim the bottom line yep. and fill their pockets at the same time, because I'm sure that there's a lot of kickback going on. So there's no oversight. Once you put it into the private sector, there's no, there's no judicial oversight as well as there's no um, accountability oversight in terms of uh, spending money and how the money is spent. Um, I wanted to ask you another question and, and that is, were you able um, to, uh, talk to or find out anything about uh, specific individuals who had actually been targeted by the software? Uh, no, I consistently ask for cases where it was helpful or, you know, anything like that. And it's always just, no, we're not going to provide that, which I kind of think is a weak because if something was used for a conviction, it's presumably public evidence or public record. So um, I'm still kind of chasing that down. I have a few ideas where it was likely used, uh, but no, um, not entirely. My other suspicion is like, especially in Minneapolis, we are obviously in a situation where the <laughs> legitimacy of the police department's been under severe questioning. And because of that, a lot of the police quit or are taking vacation time and the staffing's way down. So I think departments probably lean on this kind of technology um, and they don't talk about it, but it seems like it, it, it seems to me that it's, it would be so convenient of a thing to rely on that it's probably very frequently used. Like when, when the stories about the stingray that um, usually it was about the FBI, when that story stuff uh, started coming out, it was always, oh, we used it, you know, once or twice and it was a high profile like terrorism case or this or that. And then as the years progress, you see that they're used more and more commonly. And it really seems to my observation that it becomes a crutch. Um, and that, that brings up more security vulnerabilities too, because then what happens if you encounter a criminal organization that knows how to encrypt data or doesn't use cell phones? Are the investigators just not gonna be able to figure out what's going on <laughs> because of the over-reliance on this sort of technology? Well, some, of us that, some of us that do some outdoor activism uh, have discussed not going to rallies with mm -hmm. our cell phones for that very reason. So yeah, that's good. We, we can't be tracked. Um, one thing I, I was shocked, though, was that the ACLU really didn't seem to be very uh, aggressive on trying to come up with laws to counter these actions. That's... Um... It's tricky because the, the tracking line in Minnesota, which is, is a law and has been since 2015, 
um, which is supposed to make them go to probable cause levels of standard before using electronic surveillance. Mm -hmm. The ACLU pushed for that. And it was actually the, one of their legislative um, uh, lo lobbyist people. He was the one that was telling me that it seems like the police are just choosing to disobey this standard. And, and you can see that in these legislative reports that come from the uh, state court administrator. Um, they, they say, you know, we had a, it's, it's basically just a one page spreadsheet that has numbers of times XYZ type of surveillance was used right. and tracking warrants for whatever reason are just not on these sheets. And a, a part of that law also states that after 90 days, if um, like if they looked at my phone as part of an investigation and I wasn't charged with a crime, they were supposed to disclose that in a letter after 90 days and no one in the state has ever received such a thing. So it's pretty obvious that they're just picking and choosing. And they're, if, if the technology is so powerful and they can use it in such a quiet way with zero accountability, that's, I don't even know what to do to fix that. What, how do you, how do you even go about that without, completely taking away their ability to use the technology in a way, you know? Yeah, that's one of the problems with technology. It's always a two-edged sword, you know, mm -hmm. with the good part. It's like, let's talk about the 5G. Uh, we're going to be able to throw all these files back and forth, and we're going to have great service. But the radiation that comes off those those antennas that are outside your, your house are going to be filling you with radiation. So yeah, we have to take a stronger... As you mentioned before, we have to get on top of our uh, government to come up with laws that address these issues on a much faster, faster pace. But how do we how do we address this in the public, though? I mean, do we I guess we have to be physically affected uh, with one of these incidences to, to be able to address it? Or can we do it in a in a legislative way? with uh, the big push I, I i don't know i'm i'm in favor of the big push uh legislatively i mean we're, we we actually in minneapolis are getting quite a bit of traction with our city council as far as addressing some of these surveillance problems um one of the best uh ideas in the last couple of years uh, is actually again goes back to the aclu um, the, the acronym is Community Control Over Police Surveillance and Militarization. So it basically says that anytime, um, you know, like Louisville police or New York police want to use or buy a new technology, there has to be a public vote and there have to be hearings so that we get to say, you know, as a city, if we want that type of thing patrolling our neighborhood. Um, and that's, that's a, I think, is a really bright spot because a lot of the city councils around the country, it seems want to do something about police reform and want to bridge the gap between the community and their local law enforcement. So this is a great option. Uh, it's real oversight. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think, I think as far as the cell phone surveillance issue, that it's probably going to take a huge national effort um, akin to like restore the fourth to get some kind of uh, more reasonable approach to the third party doctrine or just a national standard that says any type of electronic surveillance requires a warrant seen by a judge, not an administrative subpoena, not a court order directed to AT&T. It's something that there has to actually be a second part of the government involved with. <laughs> Otherwise, it's purely unaccountable. Yeah, but we saw what happened in the FISA courts about judges, too. So yeah. they, they can be deceived easily, too. That, that's true. Yeah. There's a, I mean, you can extend that beyond simply cell phone technology. I mean, I know that, for example, the Baltimore Police Department for years um, uses sonic eavesdropping in uh, African-American neighborhoods. That's uh, creepy. So they just basically, they, they drive around the neighborhoods and <laughs> it's, forget about telephone conversations. They can just hear what's going on in people's houses. Right. I mean, or they can look at, you know, before, you know, during the drug wars, I mean, and it presumably still going on, uh, they can just go down to the, uh, the electric company and look at the grid mm -hmm. and look at normal electricity usage and figure out who's got a grow light factory going on, looking at weekend patterns or 
or the different patterns of electric electrical use. I mean, how that data is just simply not secure. And yeah. what are the what are the grounds that you would? I mean, I'm sure that there have been cases of people who have gone gone to court and been prosecuted on the basis of that evidence. What is their defense in terms of privacy and eavesdropping? Uh, do local police departments have a right to to take these uh, measurements? I mean, they're they're measuring everything. I mean, uh, the 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 Chinese model is you know where we're headed. I know that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there were some really interesting comments uh, on your article. Um, did you look at them? <laughs> I haven't checked them in a while. I, I I did I think the first maybe your second day that it was up, but no, I haven't I haven't really checked. So you know the one that actually caught me was this guy uh, from two weeks ago, Mr. A. R three double N four N. He says I've got a little bit of experience because there was this uh, discussion after the article of people saying, "Well, you know, you don't want to be tracked. Uh, use burner phones, and you can buy burner phones now." That you know, I, there was a question of whether burner phones actually have a GPS in them, and uh, somebody commented, "Well, now you get a burner phone; it's actually a smartphone." And this guy says he's he's been an electronics technician and he says even if you let the battery drain down to zero they could probably leave enough charge to ping off towers he says not only that they can design circuits so that if the battery is removed capacitors inside the phone could provide a little bit of juice so it could be located yep so, you know there, there's there's the there, there's the physical body and there's the ghost yeah right and <laughs> And the ghost is giving, I mean, it's, it really is surreal. So the ghost, the ghost is, is giving off information too, which yeah. I, find, uh, I find that at once poetic and just incredible. It, it, it is. I, I like how you approach that too, because I mean, the, the burner question thing especially is interesting because uh, it, it doesn't matter what type of phone it is. It's essentially social and behavioral control. The, the text in the literature that Cellhawk uses you know, the, the, they publicly put it on their website. But then when I started tweeting about it years back, when I was originally looking into it, it said, find out where your phone sleeps or where your suspect puts their head at night. So it's, it's not about like what kind of phone you have. It's just how you use it. So I don't know if burner phone would essentially do all that much. Um, and like, that's, that's, I, I, I think looking at this from a zoomed out lens, any one of these surveillance initiatives, it's essentially, that's the game. Like I've been really closely following the um, the stuff going on in St. Louis with the spy plane proposal. If you guys have seen that, it's it's pretty mind blowing. They want to fly three planes over the city on a persistent basis, and it's all about deterring people. They even talked about going into the elementary and middle schools to educate the kids. Just hey, let you know there's spy planes watching you at all times, and any anything like that. That's essentially what you're trying to do is change people's behavior. So my, my fear with all this stuff is that we're going to get to a point where it's too far to go back. You can't put any of this back in the bag. And I, I see a lot of activist groups saying things like, put your phone in airplane mode. That doesn't really do anything either. Yeah, uh, we, have, we do have to talk about how this changes on a fundamental level before we're at a place where it's too late to go back. Like, like you brought up China. I mean they got a lot of this technology from us. And a lot of these tech firms are playing both sides. The China is a huge market. They, they have a different appearance in the U.S. market, but they're making tons of money on oppressing people there and they want to do the same technological stuff over here. So we, we need to take these things seriously. And I'm, I'm happy that you guys caught at least <laughs> caught this article and maybe from here, a lot of other people can hear it. So. One of the things in this area in, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, they were talking about uh, using uh, drones to check. Th this is coming from the housing department, checking on housing uh, to see what you might have in your house that you might not be, uh, you know, you might have a farm back there or something that's against the, the regulations in the, in the area. So, yeah, they're going to make more and more use of those things. And it's really upsetting. Um, the, so, I, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, no, that's all right. Go ahead. Um, you know, you can go the exploration of the technological 
aspects of this are, are is, is actually endless. But uh, what what Sam raises in the article that uh, I'm really interested in personally is is that the the idea that a parallel police power outside the realm of public oversight ever is being generated by this. Mm -hmm. So when you asked me to uh, participate in this podcast, uh, I did a little research because for years, um, I mean, years, I'm giving my age away here, but for decades, (laughs) um, I've heard of two different organizations uh, that this sort seems to be modeled on. Uh, One is the LEAA and the other is the LEIU. Um, the LEAA was called the Law Enforcement Assistance Association, and basically it was a bunch of um, uh, gun manufacturers and security equipment manufacturers, uh, a lot of ex-cops, and they are they were they be marketing all of their equipment. So they go around the country marketing their equipment, and what are the two local you know municipal and state town and police. Uh, departments. So they've got a big Rolodex. And that Rolodex becomes a guide to who's using what equipment. And you're the supplier. So you are the central, uh, you, you are the, 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 the central server, and we're talking in analog days, uh, using digital terms, you are the nexus of their network. So I did a little, you know, I, I did a little bit of reading, and I found a very interesting article from 1979, um, uh, I can send it to you. Uh, I don't know if I can post it easily here, uh, but it's called. It was called America's Secret Police Network. It was about the LEIU, the Law Enforcement Intelligence Unit, which was founded inside the Los Angeles Police Department in 1956. Wow. And it was a it was a private organization. This article was written in 1979. Uh, it appeared in Penthouse Magazine of all places. It was written by a journalist named Pete George O'Toole, and he described something that is sort of very much of an analog version of what uh, of what Skyhawk, the way that you described Skyhawk. This was a national, uh, actually a transnational organization that involved. Uh, intelligence sharing, private intelligence sharing by police departments across the United States and Canada. Um, He printed a preliminary, he printed a um, a sketchy list of uh, membership of uh, in this organization in in almost probably two thirds of the American states, Ontario and Quebec. Uh, And it was very, very secret. Uh, A municipal police department couldn't be admitted into this network uh, unless they were recommended by two other different police departments. Oh. And once you were in, uh, you were not allowed to even report the information that you might've been sharing uh, with any other division of the police department. So they interviewed, the guy went out and he interviewed people in the Los Angeles police department. And he asked them if, if they knew about this LEIU and you know, most of the detectives and 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 top brass in the LAPD knew nothing about it. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> so it was operating as a clandestine private police, a clandestine private national police force inside um, police departments across the country. Uh, that... One of their express, one of the one of the one of the the um, guys that he interviewed. I think it was it might have been in. Uh, it was not in Los Angeles, but they were interviewing these cops who were part of this network. And they said, yeah, well, you know, one of the reasons that we founded this is that, you know, we're sick and tired of the FBI moving in on our turf. You know, we do the work, they, they get the information and, and they make the bust and they get all the credit. So they decided wow. that they were going to have their own little, you know, internal security apparatus. Now, I'm willing to bet that if you look at uh, security breaches or let's say, you um, what happened yesterday where uh, there were elements of the Capitol Police or, you know, whatever, whatever police were responsible for guarding the, the, the Capitol. Um, there's plausible deniability maybe among the brass as to what happened, but you don't know how, we, we have no idea 
how any of the security apparatus around the country has been infiltrated uh, by organizations like this. I'm sure this is just the tip of the iceberg. And the, the other thing, too, is with technology, it comes down to almost to the point where individual police officers can have some of this technology on their own. Uh, and that becomes a frightening thought. Yeah, and that's in in Minnesota. We have a history of that exact thing being abused. Uh, there was a, a news reporter who sued the city for I can't remember exactly, but it was tens of millions of dollars because they kept abusing the you know information in the driver's uh, driver's license database to like look at her picture and find her address. Um, and there was a a reporter I'm pretty close with, an investigative reporter. His information was illegally looked up by the sheriff at the time uh, using an administrative subpoena. And yeah, it's once you open the door to these abuses and it's just so readily available, it's going to continue happening. And those people only found out about it because they were working on that and they have sources within those departments. So I'm sure the abuse is rampant. And that, that that's uh, the stuff about the LEAA. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to look up that article now. Because that's, I, I have had lots of suspicions about those parallel kind of networks for a long time. And there was a, a pretty good FOIA actually came out recently showing um, just that. It was, a, it was like that exact what you're talking about, except for it was um, like an IT kind of case support email. Where, um, I, I'll have to share some of these screenshots later, but they're saying things like, I have an iPhone X10 and a Celebrite, which is like a, you know, forensic extraction thing. And they're trying to get these tips for how to properly investigate. Um, there's a, it's just strange to see that there's so much co coordination between these different um, entities. Like I, I saw very small agencies emailing for help and like someone from the NYPD would respond. And it just, my understanding of the federal system was that we, we purposely set up everything in such a fractured way that you know, random sheriffs wouldn't become as powerful as the federal government. And now they have tools like this that the NSA and the CIA, you know, they have equivalent tools, but they're just a local sheriff. So that's, it's insane to me. And um, even another example of the kind of blurred lines between the federal and state, again, in Minneapolis, there's, um, there's people looking into, uh, particularly the Council of American Islamic Relations, they're looking into a lot of these reports of um, Minneapolis Police Department knocking on somebody's door, and then later on they find out that that person was actually an FBI agent. And so the director of care was looking around and collecting all these reports, of which there are hundreds. So you'd assume that there are a lot more that are going unreported. But what he's found so far is that the, uh, the Minneapolis Police Department has a program with the FBI where they literally just share personnel. So you're not even sure if the guy in the squad car pulling you over is a local cop or if he's working for the FBI. And that has real life implications because it's a crime to lie to an FBI agent. So, you know, if you're looking to an intimidate a community, um, we, have, we have, you know, a huge Hmong population here as well as a huge refugee Somali population. And if a cop comes to your door and, you know, maybe your parents don't speak English, what are you going to do? You're just going to divert to their authority and then later on go and find out that it was actually somebody from the FBI just there to check up on you. Um, and, and some of these reports, it's literally things like the, the police slash FBI will go to you know, my brother's work or my sister's house asking where I am. And they'll just go and ask everybody they can find that knows me where I am just to make people wonder if like what I'm doing is terroristic or something. And they've been going around our communities in the city doing that for a number of years. And it's gotten basically zero press. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, in, I, I hate to say since 9-11 because you know, when you bring up things like the LEAA or the LEIU network, it's got traces back to a lot further than that. But it seems like after 9-11, it was kind of just like uh, everything was up for grabs and the feds were going to do whatever they want and empower local police with this incredibly perf powerful surveillance technology um, for, you know, for what ends. I, I just, I think, especially after the Capitol attack, you think about like all of the activists 
and journalists who've had their lives ruined because of something far less than storming into the U.S. Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's crazy. It's just it's completely crazy. Totally. So what's yeah, the next up. step for you? Where uh, Are you going to continue this, this path in these kind of stories or what's next for you? Yeah, yeah, I, I want to. Um, the good thing about putting out a story that gets a lot of attention is that people give you tips because <laughs> sometimes after this, I get worried that I'm not going to have something to talk about. But no, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, my, my next focus for the little while is actually to uh, pay attention to St. Louis, given what they're trying to do with those spy planes. Um, but yeah, there's, there are unfortunately a lot of these stories to pursue uh, and not enough time to do it. So I'll, I'll be trying to crank out as much reporting as I can. <laughs> yeah, well, good luck on it. Thanks. So Bob, how, how, do, how do we deal this from a societal point of view, though? I mean, what does the average person uh, do? I mean, I, I think, to be honest, a lot of people just don't even think about it. But we need our privacy. Well, it's become pretty commonplace. Yeah, that no one has any privacy. If you want privacy, the first thing you do is get rid of your cell phone and throw out your computer. But how would you be able to survive? Uh, I'm an anthropologist, so I mean, a lot of the um, the the small scale, uh, low tech societies that uh, I've either studied through books or or, or directly through participant observation, um, <laughs> there is no privacy. I mean, there, there's no privacy even, uh, I, could, I recall in the 80s, uh, I spent a lot of time in the Cordilleras in the, in the northern part of Luzon in the Philippines. Oh, wow. I had originally gone up there uh, to study the New People's Army Rebellion, uh, but um, being an anthropologist and meeting another anthropologist who had lived up in the region for a long, long time, uh, I began to... Um, see what was going on in these places. So it was really <laughs> funny. The, the, the NPA was doing these sort of clandestine operations in these small villages. And the, they were trying to pretend that they could blend into the villages. And uh, everyone in the area knew who they were and knew they were, they were from Metro Manila or maybe even another, another part of the Philippines, the Visayas or, or, or Mindanao. Uh, so on the political level, uh, there were no secrets. And the, 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 the proof of concept of that is, is that uh, as a journalist, when you would go back to Manila, uh, a, whether it would be a high level place like the Manila Hotel where, you know, the ABC, CNN, uh, BBC, all of those journalists were hanging out, or if it were, uh, you know, just sort of uh, print journalists or local Filipino journalists in a, in a restaurant in Quezon City, which is the the, the low rent suburb in Manila. I mean, everybody's there. The cops mm -hmm. are there. The security apparatus is there. The rebels are there. Um, they're all sitting at they're all sitting at different tables, and they all know <laughs> each other. Uh, um, I, I I flew down to um, the southern part of the country to do a story on the on the Muslim rebellion. This is 1986, and. Um, I was picked up by the uh, the Marines who were occupying one of the islands in the uh, in, in the Sulu archipelago, and I was interrogated at the at the airport. They, they brought me back from the hotel to interrogate me, and there was a um, a commander in the Filipino Marine who basically it was friendly. It wasn't an interrogation. He he made me a spam a fried spam sandwich and gave me some, <laughs> gave me some and, and gave me some warm beer. So it was already very copacetic. So, you know, he was asking me what I was doing down there. I explained to him who I was. And I was a journalist and I was trying to meet the leader of the uh, Moro National Liberation Front. And, you know, he knew, he knew him. He wasn't going to tell me <laughs> how to get him. But anyway, uh, two weeks later or uh, two, two weeks later, I was back in Manila and there was this huge demonstration uh, during the snap elections. And he was already uh, he had been re I, I ran into him in the middle of the Luneta demonstration. He had been assigned to uh, Corey Aquino's security detail. <laughs> so everybody knew everybody, and that's just on a political level. So mm -hmm. if you're on a personal level in a small village, um, yeah, even if you have had a um, Protestant education, 
which most of uh, a certain generation of the Filipinos had very, very good education. When the Americans colonized the place, they, they, they did a very thorough job of you know, teaching people uh, ABCs. Mm. Um, so uh, you also have this idea of property and privacy inside a society that doesn't know anything about privacy. You, everybody knows everything that's going on. And, and that's probably in, in, in societies historically throughout our civilization, that's been the norm. So what you're saying yeah. is it's a silly premise to, to worry about it. I'm not saying it's a silly premise. We have different standards yeah. and, and we, have different, we have different reasons for wanting to protect our privacy. Uh, but in the, in, in the different scope, I guess you could say, in, in a historical or, or anthropological scope, uh, we may be in the middle of a transition to a society where um, that, that kind of privacy is no longer available. I, I would love to pick your brain more on this specifically, because I think there is a ton to be said here, especially anthropologically. I think that you're right that I guess just thinking about humans as like a communal species instead of what we perceive in capitalism as like an individual kind of everything is about yourself. We're, we're a communal species. And I think something in modern times, which coincides with the surveillance apparatus, is that we have, we have the increased surveillance and in that we don't have the privacy. However, in modern America, it doesn't feel like we have the community that would be associated with like kind of the village that you're speaking of. So then you have all these spinoff effects of like isolation and internet radicalization that doesn't happen in those kind of like more closely knit communities maybe. I, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, we, the, this technology exists and the, the, the barriers that once isolated us into, you know, privatized individuals or family um, have come tumbling down. Uh, but we, we don't have the, the moral uh, mm -hmm. or societal equipment uh, to deal with that loss of privacy. Yeah. You know, we, we can't regulate I mean, it clearly. We don't know how to regulate, um, you know, calls to violence anymore. Right. It's become clear. Well, what, what was the name of uh, your, your article again, uh, Sam? Oh, the, it's yeah. It's uh, I think it's powerful mobile cell phone surveillance tool used in obscurity across the nation. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I have written down. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for joining us. Um, uh, anytime you guys want to come back, just let me know. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, and Sam, keep me in the loop to to let me know what you're doing. Yeah, I will. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the time. It, it was a good talk with you guys. Uh, same here. Pleasure to meet you, Sam, and thanks again uh, okay. for doing this, Mike. Okay. Thank you, man, and uh, I'll see you soon. Have a good night. All right. Good night now.